Well, we talked a few weeks ago about how Epic Universe was going to be at the New York Comic Con with a panel they were having there. There was speculation that they could reveal perhaps an opening date around that time period, but it turns out that they had the opening date announced before this Comic Con panel. And as I figured it wouldn't be, it wasn't live streamed at least by uh, New York Comic Con itself, but we did happen to get some footage here from Magical Hijinks as it seems like they were there or somebody else was there of the entire panel. So since we now have this, I figured let's go through this, watch it, and uh, give some thoughts on it as, as to some of the things that they talk about here because you had Steve Tatham and other key members of the Epic Universe team that were talking about aspects of this new park. So that's what we're gonna do in this video. So so hi, I'm Jared with Capture the Magic, and we will just get right into the video here. Uh, please welcome Steve Tatum, Executive Creative Director of Universal's Epic Universe. <laughs> Associate Director of Project, Projects, uh, Attraction Development at Universal Creative, Anisha Villas Burgos. <laughs> Uh, Assistant Director of Creative Design at Universal Creative, Greg Hall. <laughs> and welcome to the Rasta Coaster, Greg's the man to talk to. <laughs> All right. And lastly, Senior Show Writer at Universal Creative, Patrick, Patrick Brilliant. <laughs> oh, we got a lot, we got a lot, a lot to talk about and not a lot of time, guys. So, uh, Steve, I'm going to start with you. Because you are kind of the man in charge of this whole shit. <laughs> So Steve Tatum, I thought it was Tatum, but Steve Tatum, he is essentially the guy that's in charge. Like he's the creative head director. He's also the guy that was, went on a podcast earlier this year. It was with like an old friend of his, and he's the one that had initially said that they were looking to open this park in the early part of 2025. So that was a lot of the information I was going off of was basically off of him. So that's who he is. He's I don't know. I'm guessing he's the guy that's in charge of the whole thing. I don't really know. I, I have heard him just his his label or his job title is the Epic Universe Creative Director. So I don't know if that puts him at the very top, but he's at least one of the people at the very top. No pressure. <laughs> you are building what seems like not a theme park I've seen before. What, what all went into the, creating this new universe full of these worlds? So... The idea for us, for all of us here working on this park, is that this park be transformational. That is a guiding principle for us. And by transformational, we mean that in a whole bunch of ways, but I'll just mention two of them. One transformational in that we are going to transform the Universal Orlando Resort from uh, what it is today into a full week-long destination complete with four theme parks, 11 hotels, hundreds of experiences. It's going to change the resort and the business as we know, which is pretty amazing right there. That is a big deal, and I've talked about this before, but them adding this new park is a, they're essentially attempting, and we'll obviously have to wait and see how it ends up turning out, but they are, instead of being an add-on, Typically, people go to Disney World and then add on a few days to Universal Studios. They are wanting to completely change that to where almost forcing people to make a choice between staying, you know, are you going to stay four or five nights at Disney or four or five nights at Universal and trying to flip in how people, you know, come to their park. So I think that is a major aspect outside of just whatever Epic Universe has to offer. The overall business of the theme park is they're trying to shift that, and I think that's a major, major component. And I know people know that, but a lot of people don't talk about that necessarily like when they talk about Disney and Universal. But this is why I think it's very different now versus Universal having successes in the past with certain lands. But this changes the entire dynamic of what they're trying to do. It's also going to transform really the way theme parks are designed. It is a different model of the way theme parks are designed. For as long as theme parks have been being designed and amusement parks and these kinds of enterprises, they've been a collection of experiences, right? And sometimes they're grouped in loosely themed lands. But what we've done since 2010 when we opened up the Wizarding World of Harry Potter uh, and Orlando, <laughs> yes, that really has changed the model. 
So all of a sudden, instead of going on a two, three, four minute experience, you are immersed in a single story. So what we've done, think about it, we've really gone from the short storytelling business into the feature length storytelling business. And in Epic Universe, this is the first theme park in the entire world that is gonna be comprised of exclusively these feature length stories. And we have five worlds in our park that are these stories that people can spend their entire day in if they want to. And I'll just tell you what they are. I think you know what they are. They're I mean, he brings up a very good point, And I think that's something that Universal has been doing very well, which is the immersive land starting with the Wizarding World and the fact that Epic Universe is going to have five of them inside that park. But I like the way he's wording that in terms of like feature length, like lands, like it's like a whole move, like you're going on a, a whole adventure. So, I, you know, I do think that's a major aspect of this and it's definitely something different than what, for the most part, what audiences have been, you know, getting over from theme parks over the years. Now, Disney does do themed land. I'm not saying that they don't, but I definitely think that with the Wizarding World, it brought that up to a whole new level, which then forced Disney to do the same thing because after that was built, then you saw Disney do like Pandora, Toy Story, Galaxy's Edge. So like they've also done their own versions of it. But I think you you know you could say Fantasyland was there first, but I, I wouldn't say that was more like a loose combination of a bunch of things surrounding like princesses and things like that. And I'm not saying it's not done well, but I think in terms of having a very themed, cohesive land, you can make the argument that Universal is definitely, at least in the recent history, are the ones that have really ramped that up. Right up there on the screen, you go from Super Nintendo World going clockwise around the park to Dark Universe. Oh. Universal Monsters, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and, and uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Oh. Celestial Park, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, your, your park has four IP lands. I'm like, no, it has five. Just one of them is an IP land of our own invention, which is a whole other creative exercise which we're thrilled about. So that's how our park is <laughs> Which I love that there's original IP. I've I've talked about this on this channel and some people disagree with me, however you feel about that, but I do love the idea that they're doing an entire land that is an original IP that they just created on their own. I think it's a breath of fresh air. And as much as I love IPs, and I'm not against IPs, I think some people think I, I'm, I'm against putting IPs. I'm not. But I do think it'd be nice to have a little bit of a balance to where you can really show your creativity with a new idea and really you know flesh that out and uh, bring something new and fresh to theme parks. Absolutely love it. And what, okay, so this is the first, if, unless I'm incorrect, the first major Amer no, like American theme park in 20 years. It how, is. Tom, 20, how, how, 25. 25. 25. So, that's, 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 <laughs> how, how different is it going from you know creating a new land like a Wizarding World Diagon Alley versus we're building an entire park? Well. I've thought about this a lot, and you know, you can say you go to theme parks, and you guys probably all have your reasons for going to theme parks, assuming you all have been to theme parks, right? <laughs> uh, people go to theme parks, I think, for only one reason, and that reason is to make memories with people that they love. And so in order that they can do that, we need to create these environments that will support this activity. And how do you do that? It's through emotions. So how do you evoke people's emotions? And that is through stories. And how do we decide which stories to tell? So when you're making a brand new theme park, you want to have a full range of emotions that appeal to a full range of guests. And the reason that we've selected the stories that we have done is because they are epic stories. I mean that in the sense that they're grand, expansive stories with heroes that can take on supernatural challenges. And so we have done that and we can connect to people's emotions, whether it is the exhilaration of flying on a meteor and Stardust Racers, whether it's soaring with dragons and how to train your dragon, or whether it's confronting monsters that, that scare and thrill and fright. So whether it's the giddiness, the exhilaration, or the terror, you have to have this full menu of emotions, which you don't deal with when you're building one experience. 
I agree. I, I also love the fact that there's that much detail and thinking into like the story aspect. I think it's really easy to just build, say, oh, this ride, people are going to like it. But to really think about it from a storytelling perspective, uh, I, I really like hearing that. And I think it's something that Universal has been doing very well in the, you know, especially, I guess, since Comcast has purchased them as they've gotten really focused on these things. So I, I like, I love hearing that. In fact, I mean, again, I'm, I think Epic Universe is going to be a great theme park. And one of the reasons being is I like how Universal immerses you into lands that you know. So it's telling you a story that you've already kind of sort of experienced in the movies, but it maybe it's got different aspects to it, or you just get to be immersed into it uh, yourself. And I, I think that's a, a uh, part of a theme park experience for myself I can speak of that I really do enjoy. I want to, I want to talk Celestial Park. Yeah, let's do that. As you just told us, Celestial Park is its own IP that you guys have created from scratch. Yeah, see, that's the thing, is that Celestial Park is a world unto itself. Um, the guiding principle in the storytelling behind Celestial Park was to create a place where we could put the park back into theme park and really build a place that is suited for all of our explorers. And, and Steve, yeah, it's our, 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 our park itself is, is gonna be filled with epic heroes and their stories. But really, it's, it's, it's also about the fact that we're putting the storytelling and the, the questing and all of the, the work that goes into exploring in your hands. We want the park to play back with you as you play with it. And Celestial Park begins at, at, at that first gate uh, with the Kronos, and the Kronos is pulling down all the cosmic energy that allows us to be able to open up all of the worlds, uh, the portals to all of the possible worlds that, that Epic Universe has. Um, Steve already mentioned Stardust Racers, which is a dual launch um, racing coaster. Tops out over 60 miles an hour. Yeah, it's going to be so crazy. I'm so excited. Um, and then we've also got Constellation Carousel. So Constellation Carousel is where we're going to be able to ride on the actual constellations. And it's it's unlike any carousel that you've ever been on. It, to say carousel is kind of disingenuous. It kind of makes it feel like it's small, and it's not. Like anything in a universe, it's massive. And then you've also got... I am very curious. I, like you said, it's a carousel, but I'm very curious to check out Constellation Carousel because I feel like from everything we've seen about it and heard about it, it's just such a unique take on just a simple ride. That uh, I I don't know I, it sounds really cool I love like mi Greek mythology type stuff so for me Celestial Park is something that I'm intrigued by just from that aspect alone but not to mention the whole like putting the park back in theme park which I think is a great thing because I've been talking about at length about you know not just Disney but Universal as well there's so much nature aspects missing from theme parks and I'm happy to see how Universal is trying to get back to having like trees and greenery and things especially in florida if you've never been to florida in the summer uh trees and shade are something that you will come to uh, definitely desire because it's just i mean if you're there in the middle of the day it's just it's hot all the even at night it's hot but even at the daytime having shade and more trees and nature i think is a really refreshing thing for a theme park things for small children like astronomica which is going to be a a really wonderful uh play space that, that water will play back with you um, not only that, but there's food, and there's, and, and there's, yeah, there's restaurants, and there's bars, and, there's, and there's, there's a chance for the guests to refuel and recharge before they go out and continue their exploration with all the different worlds. It truly is a world to itself. It's massive. Celestial Park is, is really, really Well, I mean, and Patrick mentioned food, and you guys laugh, but I'm telling you, the food here is going to be good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Our chefs have been working on great menus. I've been fortunate to go to the tastings. I'm telling you, it's raising the bar of theme park food. I think if the food is good, like Epic Universe, I think is going to be a great park regardless from everything we've seen. And Universal knows how to do theme parks. But if they have great food, it is. I, I think it potentially can raise it to another level because one thing over the years Universal has lacked and they have gotten better in my opinion is on in the food and the newer restaurants we've had seen open a lot of the Wizarding World stuff like Minions Cafe a lot of the newer additions that they've had have been really good so I'm really excited to try out some of these food items because again if the food items are really good if they can get those to you know one thing Disney does really well is their food items and making them look good for Instagram and snacks and they've got the the nostalgia of certain foods like Dole Whip and 
uh, all those different types of food items that they have there. If Universal is able to do that as well and have really good food, I definitely think that's just going to be another thing that just kicks it up a little bit more and gives, gives it repeatability as well for people to come back and do the food items and other things like that. All I'm going to say is that if anything like the food in uh, Super Nintendo World Hollywood, like, I can't wait for all of the lunches. <laughs> I've never been to Super Nintendo World Hollywood, but I have heard the food is very good there. So I, I suppose that's an encouraging sign. Hi. We're going to talk about some Harry Potter stuff. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, our good friend Anisha here, she know, she, she, a, she is a huge Harry Potter fan. She also, she also helped de develop Diagon Alley. And, uh, so, You know it's one of the best rides ever, Hagrid's Magical Motorbike Adventure. <sighs> Alright. You worked deep on the Battle of the Ministry ride. What 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 should we expect from this? So I I sometimes think the word immersive is too small of a word for what the attraction is. So you enter in through the Metro Blue, which we collaborated with the filmmakers on developing, so you end up in the Metro flew into the Ministry of Magic Atrium at full scale, full glamour, full glory. Every time I walk into this, in every phase of construction, I quite literally had tears in my eyes. It is truly spectacularly beautiful. And it's when you enter the atrium that you learn that Dolores Umbridge is standing trials for her crimes. And what's really exciting <laughs> Time. As she should. Yeah, about time. Um, and what's really exciting about this whole story is that it takes place after the last film. And so we're really building on the entire story that you've come to love and we come to love. As you walk through the atrium, though, you get to go and travel all the different offices in the ministry. In the ministry. And one of my favorite rooms, the Hall of Ministers, you actually see ministers from the past all debating each other and talking about Dolores Umbridge and the upcoming trial. The queue is truly breathtaking. I think everyone's just gonna love it. There's gonna be a million Instagram photos, I just know it. And as you, um, as you exit the queue and start to board the ride, you board a ministry lift. And you take the ministry lift, and like any attraction, something goes wrong. Dolores Umbridge escapes, and you have to work with Ron, Harry, Hermione, and her house health, Higgledy, who you meet along the way to bring her to justice. It is truly a thrilling ride in every sense of the word. I, I've ridden it, and, I, and there's really nothing else like it. It is, I really think, the game changing and incredibly, incredibly fun. Um, so I think everyone's going to have such a blast on the entire series. I mean, they're not really giving many details about this, right? They've been rather tight-lipped about it for a while, so I don't think they're going to really go into detail. Like, she's talked about things there that have basically been in the videos they've released. But if you look at the show building for that ride, it is massive. Like, the show building itself is almost just as big as the entire Ministry of Magic land. So, and not only that, like, it's the only ride. It's the only land that has one ride in it. It has a, has a, a ride and a show. So I imagine all the money that was allocated for Ministry of Magic went into this one ride. So I don't really, I mean, uh, we know it's an elevator lift type of ride. I'm not really sure on exactly how they're doing it. I know there's some, uh, I know uh, Theme Park Stop has some videos about how, what's likely to be the case and how they execute it. But how big that show building is and just how immersive it sounds and like at scale, I I don't. I, I'm assuming this could be the best ride in in Epic Universe. It's just one that we don't know anything about really, so it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what to expect from it. But I'm kind of going in low expectations, not low, but like moderate expectations, and hopefully I'm I'm wowed about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, just the size and sheer scale of it alone is something that's impressive. <laughs> Magic, feel free to chime in on this. What about the what about the, the, the world as a whole? Because this is this this isn't just this isn't just you know another Hogsmeade or another Diagonal. This is a brand new space. It's it's Paris. In the <laughs> it's, so you walk in through the portal from Celestial Park and you get instantly transported into 1920s Wizarding Paris. And you can feel that with just all the different wand magic and the activations throughout the land along with the music and even the smell of food, it's pretty overwhelming in general. 
Um, and everything in there has kind of a French twist to it, which is really exciting. But one of my favorite parts um, as well is our live show with Cirque Our Canoe. And so we really took inspiration from the Fantastic Beasts films and pulled that into the entire land. That's why it's 1920s Paris. But then you get to go into this giant circus tent and come face to face with all of these fantastic beasts. It's, it's truly a beautiful and heartwarming story. And it's so exciting to see all of the innovation and technology from the team to bring these beasts and creatures to life. I think everyone's going to have such a blast with the entire show. And it's really, really just stunningly spectacular. Yeah, and it's a great uh, example of how we have tied two franchises together. So it connects the Fantastic Beasts and the Wizarding World. So you connect them through the Flu Network, which we've created. And so this is a recreation of some of the sets from Fantastic Beasts. And I'm telling you, you guys have been in theme parks. You've, you know what forced perspective it is. I think most of you know that you know the second floor, the third floor, they get smaller and smaller. And you're like, oh yeah, it looks pretty tall. You walk in here. It is tall. These are full scale sets. This thing is so impressive and it just does a beautiful job of connecting. You know, it's just not just Paris. It's not 1920s jazz age Paris, but it's populated with beasts. And then you connect to this original story, which we were thrilled to work with Warner Brothers on to connect uh, this story to new stories of what happens to Dolores Umbridge, as Anisha said. So it, it just. There's all kinds of new stuff here to discover. I, I think if you've watched any of the reveal videos for the lands, um, just talk about scale for just a second. Yeah. Susan, I think, was the one who actually brought up the point that if you've been to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter Diagon Alley, the Universal Orlando, yeah. 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 Um, the buildings that are inside Wizarding Paris, the smallest of those buildings is taller than the biggest building in Diagon. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to bring up that point, and then I'm, let it, I'm glad I let it roll because that's what I said. But yeah, the sheer scale of it. So, like, there still is forced perspective because it's a theme park, but the fact that it's built at scale to essentially look like a 1920s, you know, Paris in terms of the, all the size and everything about it. Uh, and just from the construction photos we've seen as well, like, it, it's huge. It is a very, very tall, immersive land. And, and again, the scale of it alone and really have a good opportunity with being, you know, France with the food here. And again, if the food is really good here, you've got a couple of food spots. I definitely think that this is going to take, you know, this land and potentially make it, you know, a great land if it has really good, authentic French food, if you like France or not, but either way, they have really good food. And if you've been over to like Disney and Epcot in the France pavilion, that's one of the most popular pavilions with all the food options they have there. So this potentially could be a similar type thing for them with just being in this Paris themed land uh, with the Ministry of Magic. It's massive. They're massive. You're walking into Paris. It's, it's incredible. Good. Okay, but the real important question, will there be butterbeer? <laughs> oh, he said, will there be butterbeer? Version of it, yes. <laughs> That's all I could ever ask. I mean, the question we ask ourselves is, will they ever let us do this again? Because it's so amazing and spectacular and immersive and technologically advanced. Now, Greg. We're also witnessing the beginning of the George Universe. So, I first met Greg when I interviewed him about Velocicoaster, and he was so passionate about it because he's the dopest roller coaster he's seen. So it seems like the people working on Epic Universe are kind of like the all-star team of Universal because you got, I, I forget her name, I apologize, but she worked on Diagon Alley. This guy's worked on Velocicoaster, so it seems like they have a lot of people that have had very good success with rides and in, in lands in you know Universal Studios already are working on Epic Universe, which is another great sign of you know the quality and the level and of like immersion that we can expect. How many people do on Velocicoaster? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but now, your baby, Monsters Unchained, the Frankenstein experiment. What kind of ride are we going to get out of this? Oh man, we're raising the bar again. You know, Blossom Coaster was a great experience and it changed the roller coaster industry and, you know, the excitement, the, the feeling with fans, seeing what the experience is was just addictive to us. We want to do it again so we'll be able to provide that experience to them in a, no, a totally new fashion. 
Now with Dark Universe, we have so many classic monsters that we're bringing together for the first time. So if you're ready for this list, man, yeah. ready for it, this one's a lot. Uh, we have Dracula, we have him, uh, we have the Frankenstein monster, yeah. uh, we have Bride of Frankenstein, that's the that's uh, land. We have Brides of Dracula, uh, we have Wolfman, uh, we have werewolves, they have their own attraction, and uh, we have Phantom of the Opera. Now that's one until recently they never talked about, but I think they may have revealed it here. But the fact that there will be Phantom of the Opera in the Dark Universe is not something I remember them talking about before. If they did, I mean, you guys may know in the comments if they did or not, but I don't recall them mentioning Phantom of the Opera before when talking about Dark Universe. I'm excited for what you're going to see with them. Uh, it's really, it's really awesome what we're doing with them. Um, uh, we have Creature of the Black Lagoon. <laughs> And we have also some cameos that we, we're not going to reveal now, but you'll be able to see them in the trash. So there's a lot more. <laughs> Turn it on him. My fingers are crossed the chop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, in, in Dark Universe, is, is awesome because, you know, it's a brand new land. And it's our opportunity to expand, you know, the universal legacy of all these amazing movies that people watch throughout the years. And, the people experience these monsters in different ways. So, you know, we're listening to the guests and we're giving them exactly what they've been asking for. And we're doing it in a way that we can only do in Universal Parks. You know, we're bringing the experience that is right of passage. You know, it's, we're going to have experiences for the family, but we're also going to have experiences for people who like to be scared and thrilled yeah. and have awesome experiences. So, you know, it starts with, uh, you know, the Frankenstein Manor that you'll see as you go into the the land, no world, and you know that's this manor's played the town of Dartmoor for so many years, and you know it's been mysterious. But there's a new resident, and that's Victoria Frankenstein, and that's the great great granddaughter of Henry Frankenstein. Now she has a new uh, purpose to show that she moves to see where others have failed, and that's controlling these monsters. Now the experience, there's different experiments that go on throughout the, the queue and through the attraction, but things go wrong and Dracula is free. And then Dracula lets loose all the other monsters and we're caught in between everything that goes on. So we're in this uh, experience and an attraction where all the monsters are let loose and they're unchained. And we're seeing how they interact with each other, how they interact with us. And it is something that has never been done even in a movie. And we can't wait to show you guys how that's done and all the new technology and innovations that we brought to make it come to life. I don't know if they'll talk about it after this, but if you've seen the preview videos for, or the preview video for Dark Universe, the animatronics that they're using not only here, but some of the other lands as well. I mean, it looks legitimately lifelike. So one of the biggest knocks against Universal over the years and a lot of, and I, you know, suppose it depends on your perspective, but is like screen based attractions. So it seems with the Epic Universe, like I don't think Monsters Unchained is going to be completely void of screens, but they are using live animatronics and actual set pieces for a, you know a lot of things and all over this park, not just relying on like 3D video and things like that. So I think that's something that is going to be different than what you've you know normally seen or expected from Universal in that sense. And again, the animatronics look insanely lifelike. So I'm very excited to see how many animatronics there are, not only just in Dark Universe but all over the park, and uh, just how they execute those because I think that's something that again the Universal has done some level. Like Kong has an animatronic there, which is a really good one. But for the most part, they're not known for this uh, when it comes to theme parks and attractions. So this is something that I think is going to help them in terms of going to that next level when it comes to like a theme park experience. Yeah, I want to follow up on that and put on Patrick and Steve also if you have something to chime in about this. I feel like for the last several years we've gotten like a Halloween Horror Nights fans in the room. <laughs> we've gotten some really cool original stories based on the Universal Monsters that are only available in the park. So can you tell us a bit more about the story of Dark Universe, like beyond the Frankenstein story, the story of Dark Universe as a whole and how how it's did like obviously we know what a, we know what a horror night space is like. How is how is walking through dark universe different than that? So, so we're building on the hundred year legacy of monster movies that we have at Universal, which is something we're very proud of. 
we're very known for. And the challenge, story-wise, was for us to come up with a place that all these monsters would coexist. And we've created this fictional village of Dartmoor, where Dr. Victoria Frankenstein, as Greg said, has come back to our ancestral home and has collected all these monsters to do her experiments. So it's really all about our story. It's using technology to create thrills. It's gonna be family-friendly in part of the ride, part of the land, but I, I'm not sure I would put small kids on uh, Monsters Unchained. It's gonna be an intense ride. But Halloween Horror Nights is a whole different experience, and Patrick can tell you that we borrow all kinds of stories that are not part of that legacy. I think what's, what's going to be um, really thrilling for me to, to watch are people's reactions to the Dark Universe. Um, primarily because, as a monster kid myself, uh, it's something wholly special in that you are watching where the movies went. The land itself could be considered a sequel to the original films. We took everything from the original films and use that as the basis for all of the continued storytelling. So uh, it's it's a it's thrilling. The ride is the ride is thrilling, and the the experiences that you're going to get are completely unique for the rest of the world inside Epic Universe. But when I say as a monster kid that that I'm constantly surprised and taken back by the experiences as one of the people that are on the team walking through the land every time I go, believe it. It's. It's something that people, uh, monster fans have always wanted, and now we finally have a place to call home for the monsters. I am curious about people who are really into like Universal Monsters. I myself, I'm not. I've, I think I've seen bits and pieces of those movies over the years, but it's not something that like I've really been into. But I am curious about people that are really into those movies, how they receive this in terms of like they just said it's like a sequel to those movies. Uh, I, I am going to be curious how that's received. I've heard some people say that they don't like the idea of this, and some people like you know, say, and some people say they do. So I come from a perspective of whatever this is, is going to be new to me. Uh, I'm not going to have the back, you know, the lore of like how it was in the movies necessarily. So in, in terms of like how they treat the properties of the characters and things like that. So that's something I will be curious about. But I think given that it's such an older IP, they do have a little bit more freedom to do some of this stuff because it's much more difficult to do something like say, you know, a Harry Potter where those movies are not that old and you're trying to tell some brand new extended story that can obviously get, you know, there's details people know about and some people don't, you know, they don't want to see a continuation of it that way. But given that this is an older IP, I feel like they might be able to get away with this, but I am curious how, you know, those fans of those properties will, will receive this. That's the one um, and, uh, and I will say, when it comes to Dark Universe, I when I first heard about it, I was just like, okay. But the more things I've heard about it, I'm really looking forward to this land. I think it sounds so unique and very cool. And again, you're talking about a land that they've, they didn't say here, but previously they've said that it's like a PG-13 type of land. So it's not something that is super kitty it's very but it's not going to be like halloween horror nights maybe somewhere in the middle with some darker aspects here and there but all the cool visual effects they've, they've teased about it uh and the different aspects of that land I, I am very much looking forward to i'm actually going back to you because we're going to hop into the the, the warp pipe down to super nintendo world there we go I don't know if you guys have been to super nintendo world on the west coast or in japan it's very very cool this one's bigger Nice. And it's bringing Donkey Kong Country in. And for those that don't know, the one in Epic Universe, the Super Nintendo World, is going to be the biggest Super Nintendo World in the world. So that's that's where he said it's going to be bigger. In case you didn't know, I mean, it's probably pretty obvious, but in case you were unaware. Yeah, um, I, I want to take a second. As, as a kid who grew up playing uh, Nintendo and have, has owned most of the systems, all of them. Um, <laughs> One of the things that, that I want to bring up is the amazing partnership between Nintendo and Universal and the creative collaboration that we've had. It's fantastic, and it's global. It's been all over the world. And now we finally have the opportunity to be able to bring Donkey Kong Country and Super, and Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo World and Super Mario Land together, the Mushroom Kingdom. And you're going to be able to, as I said earlier, when you play with the park that plays back, well, if you've been to any of the other iterations, of, of uh, Nintendo and, and Universal's collaboration together, you know that that happens to be a fact. You get to play 
with those lands and, and get to earn certain things and, and, and achievements as you make your way through. Donkey Kong Country and Minecart Madness in particular is going to be so much fun. I cannot wait to go on that roller coaster and jump track that isn't there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen what this ride is like. It's literally like the, the minecart level from Donkey Kong Country. You're just in a minecart jumping over spaces. <laughs> and if you're not aware of this coaster, first off, it is directly from the video game, which Donkey Kong Country was one of my favorite video games of all time. I remember as a kid, there was a level in that ride that was almost like it took me forever to beat. But in this, it's going to seem like you're jumping over gaps in the track. There's a, a side arm that attaches to a side track. So the visual you'll see is not really like you aren't losing contact with the track, but it is going to give that illusion. And this might be the ride I'm the most excited for just because it's so unique. And then again, it's Nintendo is my childhood. It's my nostalgia. And so uh, this probably like Super Nintendo World as a whole, I'm looking the most forward to. But this ride in particular, uh, I think has the potential to be one of the best ones because I've, I've what you say what you will about Mushroom Kingdom. I've heard the Mario Kart attraction is OK. I'm not expecting a ton out of that. And Yoshi's Adventure is very much just like a kid, you know, family ride that, that anybody can ride that. So I think the Minecart Madness will probably be the most thrilling and perhaps most like immersive type of attraction in that way. It's going to be fantastic. So, and I believe there's also, there, there's more rides, correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So you can go on Yoshi's Adventure, what? which is going to be so much fun. And is, is, is wonderful for, for us in, in building Epic Universe in that we wanted a broad range for every guest to be able to come and play. And Yoshi's Adventure is perfect for that. And then, of course, you go into Bowser's Challenge and Mario Kart. And yeah, yeah, it's so much fun. Uh, being able to go into uh, Bowser's Castle is always been like a bucket list item you don't know you have until you do it. And then you go through and you're like, oh yeah, okay, check. <laughs> I actually think going through Bowser's Castle may be cooler. I'm not, I shouldn't say that. It could be just as cool as the ride of Mario Kart, but that part, yes, very much looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 so much fun to be able to watch the evolution as a, as one of the people on the team to watch the evolution of the park come to life. But it's it's really uh, wonderful to see, obviously, the reception of people and, and, and the excitement of wanting to go to the to the park and experience things like Super Nintendo World. Um, I, I, I am, I'm a firm believer that Universal is pe like paving the way for the interactivity in the parks. And you see it in such a huge way with what Super Nintendo World has been so far. But Epic Universe has this sort of interactivity seemingly baked in throughout it. How, how important is it for you guys to have this be a, like a living, thriving thing that people will want to come back to and continue to live in? Well, I think you just said it. I think it's I think it's wholly important that, that guests feel agency and feel that their experience and, and their their movements through the park, their exploration through the park, um, remind them constantly that they are achieving things. Uh, Greg spoke about the rite of passage as far as the Frankenstein experiment. That that although it might seem scary for children to go into the dark universe, as someone who was a monster kid, uh, I would. I would have like been running to that land first to, to try and test my bravery. And that's really what, what the lands are all about. Like you've got Super Nintendo World, which is very centered on play, and you've got Dark Universe, which is centered on, on bravery, and then you've got the mystique and, uh, and, and the magic of the Wizarding World uh, in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter Ministry of Magic, and then you've got just the thrill of riding on the back of a dragon. <laughs> You set me up way too well because we're going to talk about Isle of Berg for a minute. I, so I loved the, the How to Train Your Dragon movies. I think they're yeah. and, but, I, but I will say, I, when, when I, it was announced that that was going to be one of the worlds we're going to, I was like, I don't know what that looks like. Because I can imagine what a Universal Monsters world looks like or what Super Nintendo world looks like. How to Train Your Dragon is such a, a huge, massive, colorful, like, living, thriving place. Can you speak to bringing that to life and what that experience is? Sure, so How to Train Your Dragon, The Isle of Bird is based on the beloved DreamWorks franchise. And the thing to remember about those films, which I personally love, they are beloved by families, by kids. <clears throat> but remember, all three of those films were nom by, nominated for Oscars. I mean, these are masterpieces. These are gorgeous works of art. And so the challenge for us is not just to bring those stories, the story of Hiccup and Astrid and 
that whole cast of characters to life, but also convey that emotion and do it through the artistry. So we really looked at the art direction of it without getting too deep into our design process. What's important for you to keep in mind is that we decided to enter that story at a certain point, and it was really important for us, and we call it How to Train Your Dragon 2.5, because over the course of that saga, dragons and Vikings come to coexist peacefully. And so at that peak, moment of harmony is when we enter the story. So you're going to be in there and you're going to see it when you walk into that land, through that portal. And I wish I could be there for each and every one of you to experience this moment because I, I'm already, it's already looking so amazing. But you come in and there's two giant statues. I do like how Universal does this where they kind of pick a time period like they've done this with the Wizarding World very well where you know, you're not the, the biggest gripe I have against what Disney does a lot of times is Instead of like, for instance, like Galaxy's Edge, instead of just putting you into lands that you know from the movies, they're telling an extended story that's taking place in like this this outpost, and then they retroactively make everything that you know the older movies. Everybody was here, and all the stuff like that. And Universal, you know, again, Monsters is doing that on some level, but I think it's a little different given it's an older IP. So they all do it to some extent, but I do like how they just take a a point. And they just say this land essentially exists in some time in this period and not have to get too specific about like, you know, continuity and things like that. So I feel like putting it into this spot where they're putting it, where they say like they're coexisting between the dragons and the people makes a lot of sense. And I do wonder on some level if this land would have happened if it wasn't for the popularity of, say, like Game of Thrones because Vikings and dragons are just cool. It's kind of a timeless thing, because this is a little bit of an older IP, but I do have a feeling they're probably going to do some new movies as well, because they introduce this land, you have some new movies come out, they help each other. So I think that's probably an aspect to this, but I think in general, if you just have a dragons and Viking land in general, even if it was from scratch, I think it would probably go over pretty well. So I think that aesthetic alone is something that would be uh, very enticing for a lot of people, myself included. Because I don't imagine a theme park would probably do a Game of Thrones land, given you know Game of Thrones is pretty adult oriented, pretty violent, and has a lot of aspects of that that wouldn't be you know suitable for a theme park. But How to Train Your Dragon very much would be. I wish I could be there for each and every one of you to experience this moment because I, I'm already, it's already looking so amazing. But you come in and there's two giant statues, uh, which you can see here, which is a Viking and a dragon, which symbolizes really the story point that we're making. And with the art direction, when we spoke to the art directors of the films, as that harmony becomes closer, the world becomes more colorful. So we are at peak color saturation, so the choice of colors in every one of those design elements really serves that story point. If you've seen the construction photos of this land, I mean, they're he's very right. It's very colorful, like a lot of color saturation, very vivid greens and reds and all sorts of stuff like that. So from the from just a look standpoint, it does look like a fantastic land. Then when you walk into this world, that world will immerse you, you'll be surrounded by it, and you will be living in this medieval Viking village. And the thing about this world is that it has more attractions than any of the others. So there's a family coaster, hiccups, flying gliders, where you get to soar with dragons. There's a Broadway-style show, untrainable. There's the Viking training camp. Where it's a kid's play area. There's dragon racers rallies where you get to test your acrobatic skills. So it's very rich, not only story, but also with lots to do. So it's really bringing that world to life in an amazing way. And I think it's a really important thing for Universal to continue to do. So they've made a lot of efforts in the past few years to really start doing things more for families and younger children. So when we started going to Universal quite a bit. You know, our kids were well younger, of course. They were a little bit, you know, years ago. But there wasn't a lot of things for kids to do. But since then, you know, they've got Minions Land. They've got DreamWorks Land. And they've been adding more things for kids to do. So this land in particular is very kid-friendly. But it ha I think it has enough thrills for, you know, all ages but having the Viking play area, having the boat ride, having the, the dragon show and just how immersive the land is and, and perhaps hiccups wing gliders as well. I don't know if that'll be for like little, little kids, but either way, I think this is another extension of them doing more things for younger families and younger kids 
where you know I, I I think they are trying to definitely you know tap into the market that Disney has dominated for a long time, and I think they feel like they have a pretty good opportunity with some of their IPs that they have, and of course you know Super Nintendo World fits into that as well. So I think that's an aspect to Epic Universe that I know people have talked about, but I do think that's something that they're definitely looking to attract more is like you know families with younger kids having things made for them that they can do but also having enough things for everybody else to do as well and and you've talked about interactivity so it's an interactive boat ride and so the thing about technology we don't use technology for technology's sake we do it in a way that's invisible to the guests but serves the story so that Guests can have agency in this world and they can do things when they go through the portals, when they go on the interactive boat ride, when they do wand experiences, when they do all of these things, they will find themselves supported by invisible technology in a way that immerses them even more in the world without it being about technology, but it's supported by technology. Good way to put it. And that technology and that interactivity, how, especially with something like this, like I'm, I'm looking at this, this concept art, I'm like, that's going to be a real place we can all go visit. But also, like, it being so interactive, you get to sort of live out your, like, in all these things, you get to live out your own versions of the story, yeah? Absolutely. That's the whole idea is that when you go into through these portals, you are immersed in these worlds and you're in the middle of it and you are just looking around 360 degrees and you're like, I'm there. I mean, it's different. It's not like I'm being reminded of these stories or I'm in a place that looks like these stories. It's I am there. That's our goal. And something they're able to do with Epic Universe that they haven't really been able to do at least on a massive scale in the existing Universal Parks, are sight lines. And something Disney historically has done very well is immersing you into a land with not only visuals, but like sight sounds, uh, smells even. And a lot of times they'll block things, you know, well, historically speaking, some of the newer lands, not as much, but they've always been able to do that. Whereas Universal has had the issue of not as much land. Now, I think Diagon Alley and Hogsmeade have done a pretty good job there, but there's some aspects where you can still see stuff away. But in this park... One would assume that you're not when you're in, say, Super Nintendo World, you're not going to be able to see the other lands. So, or in, in any of these lands, really. So, when you're in here, you are fully immersed. And I think that's something that, yet again, just from an immersion interest, from a an experience standpoint, is something that Universal has not brought to the table on this level that they're looking to do with Epic Universe. <laughs> We all love rides, but there's there's a lot of stuff going on here that is not rides. Can you talk to us about some of the sort of the not the non ride experiences? We we've heard about some of the shows, but like what else can we expect? Uh, I mean, like anybody who's ever been to a theme park, you have meet and greets with characters. That's that's clear. Um, right? Yeah. Woo! We love, <laughs> we love meeting our friends. Um, and throughout this park, you're going to be able to go into these worlds and meet characters from all over those worlds. But there are definite changes in meet and greets. There, there are there are advances that we've made technologically speaking, but never for flash and bang by itself. It's all about the story that we've done to enhance guest experiences. And I can't get into specifics of it because I don't want to ruin anything. And I've been told that I'll be darted if I do. Um, but but suffice it to say that that's not where the entertainment stops. Um, Steve brought up. The, the Untrainable Dragon, which is over in the uh, How to Train Your Dragon Island Burke, and, and Anisha talked about the Cirque Arcanoe over in the Wizarding World. Um, and those are two massive shows. They're, they're gorgeous and they're going to be amazing. Um, but there's also the way in which we interact with entertainment that is going to be a little bit different inside the park. And when you, when you talk about, Steve, you, you brought up the idea that when you step into these worlds, you are in that world. And that's something that has become a, a, a difference in thought process in that it's no longer you just happen to be in that world. You are actually of that world. Any of the people that are inside that world would turn around and look at the portal you just walked through and see a continuation into the forest or see a rock wall of a mountain. They don't know anything else different than what is in that particular world. And that allows for us 
to have a difference in storytelling and engagement when we do something like a meet and greet and we do talk to Astrid or we do talk to Hiccup or we do meet Toothless. There's opportunities, there are opportunities inside, inside each of the worlds for guests to be able to have that wish fulfillment and to be able to go to these places that they've only either seen on screen or in other media. And that is something that is truly wonderful for us uh, as creators. We get to be able to provide those wishes. I don't know if they'll go into it, but I, I don't know if it was here or not, but they, they are going to have like voice uh, aspect to the meet and greets kind of now Disney used to with Mickey, but that, and they do this over in Hollywood's universal studios with the uh, Luigi peach and Mario meet and greets where they have a team member off to the side with like an iPad and he'll push buttons and they'll say things that I don't know if that's what they're going to do in Epic universe, but I have heard that they are going to have like animatronic or not animatronic, but voice aspects to the meet and greets that I think would is something that can bring that to you know another level as well uh, if you look over at like DreamWorks land where they got the donkey and Shrek meet and greet like obviously they have somebody voicing uh, donkey but I think it adds an, another interactive aspect to meet and greets that you know when you talk about meet and greets that's definitely an area where Universal could you know improve upon they're not known for those as much as say like Disney is but I think it's something that they're going to continue to evolve and become much more of a staple uh, we're, look, we're looking at we're looking at a map of park right now, and I, there seems to be one thing we haven't touched on yet, and that is the giant hotel that seems to be inside of the See, look, talk, talk to me about Helios because this isn't so. Oh. Yeah. You guys like us? <laughs> <laughs> Universal Helios Grand Hotel is basically gives you the opportunity to stay either is it is it theme park adjacent or is it more or less inside the park? Okay. This is the Helios Grand Hotel, a Lowe's hotel. So you know it's a quality hotel. And there are views right inside the theme park. So if you want to know what's happening at the theme park at three in the morning, get a room in this hotel because you'll be able to see inside that park. So it's immediately adjacent to the hotel. There's an entrance from the hotel into the park. There's park entrance. We have never done this. There's no park that we have ever done in the United States particularly that has this experience. And so you'll be able to stay in this hotel and guess what? If you're a fan of How to Train Your Dragon, as I am, there are How to Train Your Dragon suites. <laughs> so you can live, and I, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. But you can live 24-7 in that world. You can go to the world in the day, then you can stay in the suite at night. So there are views inside the room, uh, from the, into the hotel, and there are How to uh, Train Your Dragon suites in the hotel. And the theme of the Park, Celestial Park in particular, is extended into this. So Helios, and it has uh, astrological and celestial and heavenly um, thematic elements. So we have looked at all kinds of things in our research, the Hubble telescope photos, the, the, uh, you know, the maps of the solar system, all of these things, you'll find elements the spheres you know, uh, of the planet's orbits, all of these elements, we have researched these extensively, and they will show up as elements in there. So it's not just an ornate hotel, it carries that theme of Celestial Park. And, and why Celestial? Because that's the greatest frontier. That's about exploration. And the idea of Epic Universe is to go to worlds beyond which have never been seen where nobody's ever been. And what better theme than the heavens to do that? I mean, I really like everything I've heard from Steve Tate. I'd say Tate. I think it's Tate. Or, uh, I can't remember exactly how you say his last name. But everything I've heard from him, I love his passion when he talks about this stuff. And you can see it as he's talking. He's very passionate about this. And just from someone who's ahead of the creative side of things, it's something you like to see. And I, you know, I, it's nice. I've never really seen a panel where people that were designing a ride or a theme park really sat down in this type of a setting to really go over it and things like that. So I, I enjoy hearing him talk about it and seems like, you know, his passion comes through with it. Oh, also he used to be an Imagineer as well. So he's another person that used to work for Disney. They came over to universal and now he's doing, uh, you know, big things for universal. And the fact that the storytelling continues on into your room at night. And never end. <laughs>
Should be noted too, since they announced this, like you know, Helios surprisingly is not as expensive as I thought it was going to be. So I figured it was going to be eight hundred dollars plus for this. Uh, it was something that maybe one day we we would be able to do. But it turns out, I mean, if you're in a broader package, you can stay at Helios for as low as like two hundred ninety three dollars per night, depending on when you go. Uh, we were able to book a night at on opening day, and it was in the low four hundred dollar range, which is way lower than I ever thought it was going to be. So we're going to be able to, and we'll talk about it, we'll do some videos and, and review it here on the channel, of course, but we'll stay at Stella Nova, Terra Luna, and Helios on their opening days at all these parks. And on top of it, we did get tickets to Epic Universe on opening day as well. So lots of exciting things on that front. So there's a lot of more content coming in the coming year when it comes to like actual Epic Universe content and doing things in the parks there. But I just want to know it's not as expensive, and I think it's a smart move in how Universal's been pricing their hotels. And uh, I'm looking forward to you know checking it out and trying it out. Uh, I, I, I do want. I, I've got I've got questions. I'm, I'm very curious, and I'll you know what? I'm gonna start with you, Michelle. <laughs> what is everything that's going on? Obviously, you're very you're, you're like you're very sentimental for what's going on in the Ministry of Magic area. What is the one thing? What's the one thing you personally can't wait to ride on opening day or do on opening day? And then what do you think is the thing that everyone else is going to be very stoked to do on opening day? So the thing that I'm very personally excited for is actually to walk through every single land's portals. Um, every single land, not just the Wizard World of Harry Potter and Ministry of Magic, is, it is architecturally stunning. You go through a portal and you enter into an entirely different world. And that vista and view, I mean, if you can imagine, you're walking through, you have the score, you have the smells, you have the people. It's it is really, really incredible. Just right now, even though you know we aren't even fully completed, getting to experience that moment is really fun, and I can't wait to do it with all my friends and family with me and get to enjoy everyone's hard work. Um, I think everyone's going to just love that experience. And then selfishly, I've always um, I've loved standing in the exit queue of every single ride that I've opened, seeing the reactions from guests on opening day is quite literally the best thing. You know, social media hasn't ruined it, no one knows what to experience, and you get to see genuine response and genuine emotion. And so when people get off the battle at the ministry, I mean, that ride, I truly believe, will, have, will be a game changer for the entire industry. It will redefine, in my mind, what immersion really is. It's so fun, and I can't wait to see everyone's reactions, because I think everyone's gonna not even really know what they just experienced, and I can't wait to see what that look, look at what that look is on everyone uh, going through the ride. I mean, that sounds cool. I imagine, though, the people that designed Fast and Furious Supercharged, they were excited to see people's reactions when they're getting off that ride. May have had a rough afternoon when that ride opened. I don't that just popped in my head. I was like, as, as you may be excited about this new ride, and you're like, oh, they all hate it. Oh no, this isn't. <laughs> <laughs> that ride's terrible. But like I said, not everything's a home run that's been done by Universal over the years. But, you know, I, I think Epic Universe is going to have uh, way more hits, put it that way, versus duds. <laughs> All right, Brandon, what, what is the thing you are most excited to do on day one? And what, do you, what is the thing they should be most excited to do on day one? All right, so. I've worked on some pretty awesome attractions and you know the thing that really excites me is similar to what Nisha was saying. You know, we even though we know everything that's going on in the attraction because we've been working on it for years and we created new inventions for it, it's sort of like having a, a present, a surprise present for someone. Like you know what's in the box, but you know, you just decided for them to open it up. So, you know, we find ourselves just getting just as excited as everyone else, and especially someone working on it for years and we created new inventions for it. It's sort of like having a, a present, a surprise present for someone. Like, you know what's in the box, but you know, you just decided for them to open it up. So, you know, we find ourselves just getting just as excited as everyone else, and especially sometimes when we ride next to a guest that doesn't know we were on a team that helped develop it, and getting their reactions, you know. Like, some of the rides I worked on, I'm, I'm just, like, I know what happens, but I'm just screaming with them, just, just, <laughs> sound like, goes ah! You know, just, just, just because we're having fun. And, you know, I'm, I'm making a memory with someone I, I never met before. And, you know, like Steve said earlier, it's about making memories. And, 
we have a lot of new things in this attraction, um, especially, you know, Monsters and Chain, where from the queue, there's something in every scene of the queue that's, you know, built for the guests to, to make a memory, be able to you know, share with their friends, and uh, that no one's suspecting what's going to be there. And um, there's so many things that's mysterious going on with this entire land that people, that we haven't released yet. And, you know, even when we, uh, are working on the attraction right now, we see people, like we, we have something up for the first time, there's people in the building jumping up and down in excitement. So, you know, it's very true. Once this is open, that, that's going to be the most exciting thing for, for me. I, I will say, as, as someone who has been going to the park since the 80s, Line queues now are the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I can't. I can I want that. I, the lines could be a ride to themselves most of the time. Yeah, definitely. The, the experience is like I, I really think a lot of people will just go through the queue just to experience that. You know, even if someone's not ready yet and they're they, they're a little intimidated and scared, I think you know they'll, they'll experience the entire queue and then come back later and experience the attraction. And um, you know that's what we built it for. Built for everyone to, to have fun and enjoy it with a friend's film. Awesome. Patrick, tell me what is, what is the thing you're most looking forward to doing on day one, and what should they all line up for on day one? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, we're a very small group here, but there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of people that have worked on this park since its, its beginning days. Uh, millions of man hours are going into the, the building of the of the parks and the attractions and all the worlds you'll get to experience. Um, but what Steve said at the very beginning of this uh, rings true for me, and, and I I am excited to be able to go into this park and I'm going to pull the dad card because I want to see the reaction on my 12 year old, my 10 year old's faces. I want to build those memories with them going to this park. I want to see the, the the experiences that. I and, and everybody in, on, the, on the team has become very familiar with. I mean, I'm glad to hear somebody on the creative side having kids of that age because, again, I think this is a demographic that Universal is really trying to gear up more for. So, and probably when they started working in this, his kids were, you know, four years or, you know, five years, who knows how much younger. So, for, as somebody who has younger kids myself, I'm I'm personally happy to see that sort of demographic uh, being thought about and having somebody who has kids working on this. I think that's a, a good thing to bring into the mix on the creative side. And we've, we've looked at countless times, but being able to see their reactions to the experiences. And I think the thing that, um, I think the thing that I'm very excited for all of you to experience is the joy of being able to jump between the worlds, to be able to take a break in Celestial Park and relax and recharge before going on another adventure somewhere else. And Epic Universe provides so many different opportunities to do that exploration that that's something that I'm very excited about. It's the scope and the scale of the, of the experience and, and the adventure you're going to go on. Awesome. That's a good answer. You, you know this park inside out. You are the good uh, man to answer this question. I'm okay. most looking forward to and what should they most be looking forward to? I'm familiar, yes. So, so uh, <laughs> I, really I, I remember being on that piece of land in 2018 and it was dirt. It was nothing but dirt. And these people and people like them have put their blood, sweat, tears, and heart into this and have created something that you will not believe. And I've got my spot picked out. So. Inside the Kronos, which is our front gate, which is animated, by the way, our front gate, which is spectacular. And when you go inside of that gate, I'm going to be sitting there near the Luna statue, and I'm going to be watching the looks on people's faces as their jaws drop wide open and mouths are agape. And I'm going to think about how they've planned for this day, they've thought about this day, and they're now making a beeline to their favorite portal. I'm going to watch whether they go to dark universe or super nintendo world or the wizarding world of harry Potter. i have a feeling he had a pretty strong hand at celestial park because he's talked numerous times in this panel alone about in terms of like celestial and and going for the stars and things like that and him talking about luna park there i, I have a feeling he was probably i mean obviously in charge or, or part of the whole park but i have a feeling he had a pretty strong hand personally in celestial park if i were to guess 
your magic or dark or, or Isle Dragon, um, Isle of Burke. And I'm going to think back to when I was a kid, when I was nine years old. And I, I grew up in Southern California, and I remember riding the tram at uh, Universal Hollywood. And I later became a tour guide at Universal Hollywood. And I, and I remember thinking when I was nine, and, and the flash flood was coming from the tram, I was like, somebody made this up. Somebody took a blank piece of paper, they took an idea, they just they made a model, they drew words, they made pictures, whatever it was, and that's got to be the coolest job in the world. And guess what? It is. I love this dude's passion. I'll just say, you can say, if you're not excited about Epic Universe, that's fine. I personally am. But hearing his passion talk about this during this whole thing, like, I'm even like I'm even more excited hearing him talk about some of this stuff and like you know you can tell that there was like love and care given to many aspects of this park but um, yeah I mean I never would have imagined somebody getting actually choked up talking about theme parks but you know I, he he definitely seems very passionate about uh, about everything they're doing. <laughs> every day to make something that our grandchildren's grandchildren will one day enjoy. I okay, I love hearing that cuz you have somebody talking about like the future and like legacy. And these are things that to me scream of like Walt Disney's mindset in terms of like how he would think about timelessness and I I love hearing that they're not just thinking about is this going to be popular or something relevant for two, five years, they're thinking generationally. Now, whether that ends up happening or not, it's kind of beside the fact, but the fact that they're thinking this way as a company is something that I think is a very good thing and something that I think if you're a Universal fan and looking forward to what they're doing, I think this is a really promising thing to hear in terms of their mindset is not necessarily on the right now. Like, like it is, of course, in terms of they want to create something that's relevant and popular now, but something that will stand the test of time I I like here. I mean, I'm liking hearing all the things I'm hearing here. I didn't really know what to expect from this. I was, I was kind of figuring it was going to be a bunch of regurgitated stuff we've heard before, and some of it is. But you can really hear how much thought and care has been put into this, and how much they love what they're building here. And to leave a legacy like that is something phenomenal. So that's that's what I'm going to be thinking about on day one. Nick, you just won the answer there. It's all emotional. This is all show. Obviously, we know it opens May 22nd. <laughs> okay, so that's basically the entire panel there. So, um, again, honestly, going into this, I didn't really know how much they would reveal. I kind of figured it was just going to be regurgitated stuff and not much new. But there were some tidbits in there that were really good. But I think the thing that comes through on this is... Is just the amount of thought and care and creativity and really, I mean, you can tell from Steve Tatham there, like the amount of passion that is involved in this. Uh, as somebody, again, if you've watched this channel for any length of time, you'll know that I'm very excited for Epic Universe. Been watching the construction progress for uh, over a year, at least a year and a half now, maybe two years now. It's been a long time of just seeing this park really come from dirt into what it's becoming and opening next year. But hearing him talk about is how like you can just hear the passion he has for it, and, like getting emotional talking about thinking about how he went to a theme park when he was nine years old and thinking that was the coolest thing ever and he's able to do that now like i love hearing these things and these little details here i mean in terms of information on the panel i thought this was a really good panel it's not often you get to hear from people who were directly responsible for designing not only a theme park attraction or land but like an entire theme park set down in a setting like this to really give some thoughts and insight on it so i think it's a really unique opportunity to hear that it's a breath of fresh air and really it's a throwback in my opinion to what disney imagineering used to be was much more on this level whereas now i feel like in my personal opinion it's gotten very corporate and not taking risks and is this going to make money and is this going to you know it's like it's very just by a spreadsheet and i'm not saying they're not interested in making money obviously they are but i do feel like that they're thinking through a different lens 
Some people don't like when I when I talk about Disney versus Universal. I do. I think it's a good thing. I love competition. So I come from a sports background. So I think competition and fighting with each other is a good thing. I think in the end, the guest wins. So when I see you know them doing this and compared to Disney, yeah, I'm going to compare it because they're going after Disney. And I think if I'm Disney and if they weren't worried about Epic Universe, if they watched this panel... I'd be pretty nervous considering, A, Steve Tatham used to work for Disney, and also just seeing the passion and the thought going into this and the fact that Disney's not going to have any of their stuff ready uh, for you know years now after Epic Universe opens and comparing the approaches that the two different parks have and how, in my opinion, it has kind of shifted and come full circle, whereas Universal is now the one driving the innovation in the theme park market. And yes, Disney has the market share, but you can really see the passion here with them and just really how they're pushing the envelope on theming and immersion and all these things that they're not only doing now, but they've been doing for a, you know, a period of time that Disney's been trying to answer for. So again, as somebody who's been very excited, I, I actually like maybe not a ton of information that I hadn't heard before. Some things like we talked about the Phantom of the Opera being in the Dark Universe. I don't think that was something I had heard before and some little things here and there, but just hearing the way they're talking about it and things like that, I, that's something to me that has just got me you know, more excited for Epic Universe. So again, shout out to Magical Hijinks. I'll put a link in the description. You can go check it out on their channel. I'm assuming they were there or somebody was there to check this out, but it's really good video quality. Uh, sometimes with these, given they're recorded on a phone or another device, sometimes the audio can be really bad. The audio is actually pretty solid with this. So uh, shout out to them for a quality video there and putting this up. So if you want to go watch it without me interrupting and saying my thoughts on it, feel free to go there and do that and uh, go check out the video there. But Either way, it's already, it was a kind of a longer video anyway, so I'm not going to talk much more at all. So that'll be it for this video. But if you like this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel as we do lots of coverage here of Universal Studios, Epic Universe, Disney World, and pop culture. And let us know in the comments, what do you think about this panel? And does it give you any more information or excitement about Epic Universe? And until next time, we will see you in the parks.